Hi, my name is Dr. Chiri Tan and I welcome you back to this um, video again. Now, this particular video is for those of you who will be embarking on a project that requires data collection and probably requires research ethics approval. If you are doing a systematic review, then I w this may not be the appropriate um, video for you and you might want to go to the next video in the, um, within the hub itself, which talks about writing a protocol. Now that's for those of you who are doing systematic systematic review. For those of you who are doing data collection, what you need to do, first of all, after you've actually discussed with, um, with your supervisor what the scope of your project is, is to write a proposal. A proposal is simply a report and a justification of what you plan to do and what are the research and evidence surrounding why that research question is, appro is appropriate. Essentially what it needs to demonstrate is that there is a knowledge gap that needs to be filled and that knowledge gap will be answered by the research question you are pro proposing and your project will then collect data to actually address the research question which will then pluck the appropriate knowledge gap. The proposal itself um, will include several um, elements. For example, you, you will have a 2000 word proposal, but on top of that, as a supplement to it, you also need to fill in a research ethics form, and that's for the Queen Margaret University Research Ethics Committee's review. And attached to that particular uh, research ethics forms, you'll probably also be required to fill in a participant information sheet, which, will, uh, which is given to participants who will come into your project um, to be able to know what's going on. Another documentation that is important is the consent form. The consent form uh, is a, a um, sort of legal document that, um, that the participant is saying that they agree and knowing all the terms and conditions of what your study is about and therefore agreeing to come into your um, particular study and participate in it for you to data collect from them. It's very important to note that the project cannot proceed without any of these approvals in place. For those of you who are, collect for those of you who are collecting data within an NHS con uh, context, please be aware that you also need to probably um, apply for NHS research ethics. Now that you, that you need to, uh, to access the Health and Research Authority website for its research ethics service and um, I would encourage you to approach your NHS um, research and development board, uh, research and development committee, uh, department to get more advice on how to do that. Some of our academic supervisors will also be able to advise you on that as well. If in doubt, always come back to me and email me and I can give you the appropriate guidance as to where to approach. Be aware that Scotland and the rest of the UK have slightly, just very slightly different um, sort of approaches and processes for gaining NHS research ethics approval. Now the research proposal contains all the scope and definitions of what you're trying to do as well as what is the scale of the problem and also it also then um, proposes to the reader how you're going to approach this problem in terms of the methodology that you're going to, to, um, to adopt and what are the sort of analysis that you're going to do to, to analyze the data that you've collected and sort of how to come to a particular conclusion. Why do we need a proposal from you? Well, for several things. One of the first is that we are trying to develop the critical thinking faculties that you, as a master's student, is trying to gain within this degree itself. And secondly, one of the key skills of a master's graduate would be is to be able to synthesize massive amounts of literature and condense it such that it can convey in a much more simple and efficient manner 
and gain the um, support of the reader to agree with you that this indeed is a research question that is worth answering. We also need to know that you have chosen the most appropriate methods and approach to be answering the question, which is why that is will be included in the proposal itself. And most of all, this particular um, the, the proposal acts as a communication tool to tell people how you're going to do this and why your particular project is important. Because if nobody understands what you're trying to do, then a lot of the effort that you put into the project itself will just simply go to waste. For project proposals, they tend to have a fairly standard format and this tends not to deviate very much. So, on this slide, it gives you most of the um, sort of sections that a proposal would contain. So it's worth, when you are writing a proposal, if you're writing from scratch, it's worth putting all these section headings down and then creating spaces in between your document so that you can then start filling in the information. So let me just run down the um, standard format of what a proposal is. Firstly, you have the introduction, literature review, and background. Now this sort of summarizes some of the most important research surrounding the area that will then justify and support your research question. A lot of students tend to go in and sort of go in heavily on epidemiology and etiology of a clinical condition they're interested in. Sometimes this may not be the most appropriate approach because it takes too much attention away from perhaps what you're trying to address. What you need to do is perhaps to put a little bit of the epidemiology and etiology but more of the clinical context after which you should be putting in some of the perhaps key research that has been done in the area before. If not much has been done then what you can do is take parallel research from similar areas and put that in. And that should link directly to your research question. For everything that you write within the introduction and literature review or background, you should always be aware that every single uh, point that you make should logically link back to your research question and research aim. If something does not link back to your research question and research aim, then you need to question whether that should be included in the proposal at all. After all, it's only a 2,000 word document and so you want to be as efficient and concise and succinct in your word use as much as possible. Of course, it is a skill. It's not easy to be able to be concise and succinct and yet get all the points in. This is when um, multiple drafts will help you. And do not be afraid to draft it again and again and reuse different bits of writing. And a, a, a lot of us um, within the university, as well as a lot of other clinicians who have done similar projects before, would have gone through multiple drafts before we are finally satisfied with something that can actually go through and be put for, pro, for approval. <coughs> and of course, your academic supervisor is there to help you, to guide you in terms of some of development of your ideas and the logical sequencing of your arguments to support and justify your research question. The next section is your aims and hypotheses. It's especially important to state very clearly what that is. If not, what will happen is that people won't be able to understand what you're trying to achieve within this um, project itself. If they're unclear, then the likelihood of more delays within the approval processes will occur. And also, again, remember, link your research question back to everything that you've written about in the literature review previously or in the, within the introduction. The next section is usually fairly simple. Um, it is simply a description of what you're trying to do for your project in order to uh, answer the research question. It's the methods section. Within the methods section is usually when all the technical bits come in. What you're going to, uh, who you're going to recruit, how you're going to recruit them, how you're going to get that consent, what outcome measures are you going to use to measure any improvements or change, or perhaps if you're doing intervention, how are you going to um, of, uh, get uh, to um, conduct the intervention itself? Do you require any approvals from services, from your managers, 
or how are you going to get the agreement of the different sites to provide you and refer you the participants. All these needs to be considered within the method itself and we will be actually looking very closely at that to ensure that everything you do is, uh, in, in terms of the risk has been minimized as well as everything is efficient and appropriate. Within the methods, usually we also tend to look, uh, have a little section called analysis. And with, what that is, is that what you propose, how to actually analyze the data. It may be statistically, it may be using a, a philosophical approach, for example, for qualitative research. So you need to outline that so that people do understand how you're going to utilize the data to reach the conclusions that you want to reach. A particular section that we also focus very much on are the ethical considerations. You, you do not need to expand on that too much, but it is good to actually outline some of the key ethical considerations. Do not be too gener generic about it, but try to be very specific to the particular project that you're doing. Different projects will have different ethical challenges and risks and considerations. So think through, step by step, um, as to what are some of the ethical considerations that you need to put in as points within the proposal itself. One very good way of thinking about and trying to uh, think about ethical considerations and the risks involved is to put yourself in the shoes of a participant from beginning to the end of the project. As you, as you imagine yourself to be the participant going from getting, uh, being recruited, getting the information, to um, being uh, consented for, for, the, uh, for the project, to making an appointment to coming in for data to be collected, or perhaps to be treated, all the way to the end where they actually exit the study itself. Putting yourself in the shoes of the participant will let you have some insight as to some of the potential bottlenecks or some of the difficulties that the um, participants might face or some of the dilemmas they might actually come across. And these will, can then be translated into ethical considerations. By doing so, it will help you improve your project because then you'll put in place processes to help safeguard the participant, but also to make your study much stronger. It is a crucial skill that people tend to not put too much effort into it. In fact, it is quite a highly advanced skill to be able to reflect the journey of the participant throughout the project and then factor in the ethical considerations and the, um, the actions taken to help minimize any risk involved. <coughs> Within the proposal itself, we probably ask you to put in a timetable of events of the of, of, uh, from the beginning of the project right to the end. This allows the reviewer to be able to have um, a view, an idea of how much time you're spending on each stage of your um, project itself. It will also help you to plan your life, um, so, uh, your, 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 your project with your other commitments as well. And you can then adjust as appropriately to, to see where the bottlenecks are and perhaps you give it more time or perhaps you don't need so much time for this particular um, event or task within the entire project and then therefore reduce that time and put that time to something else which may require a bit more buffer time. It's really important to have, a, have sit down and think through that in collaboration with your supervisor if you need help. A lot of students underestimate the amount of time that they need for the entire project. I would recommend between, on average about one year for this entire project, especially if you're working part-time for your dissertation. The range in terms of what, um, how, how long people take to complete a project ranges from between 10 months to one and a half years. So one year is a sort of middle ground. You should try to achieve and complete your dissertation within one year. However, if that is not appropriate for whatever reasons, perhaps your family commitments or your work commitments, then what you need to do is factor that in and sort of add it on to the tail end so that what you do is that you produce a good enough quality product towards the end to submit for your dissertation. It will be worth thinking about some of the resources that you need as well in terms of your project. 
What are some of the costs involved? Do you need additional staff? Do you need stationery? I'm aware that most of you would be self-funding and therefore um, this resource um, sort of mapping would be a purely academic exercise. But then again, it's worth having a look at see what sort of resources that you need. Perhaps you then need to put aside resources or perhaps you can even uh, request from your employer some, or, uh, some money or funding to help resource this particular project, especially if the project is relevant and will contribute to the development of the service for the employer themselves. Within the, at the end of the um, proposal, there will be certain appendices that you need to attach on, which I've talked about, which is your research ethics forms, your participation information sheet, as well as your consent forms. So this, all of these documents will form, form the entire bulk of your proposal um, that you need to submit to the Queen Margaret University Research Ethics um, Committee. For you, um, the research, there are multiple layers of research ethics committee within Queen Margaret University. For this particular master's dissertation, you'll only be required to go through the um, division level. So, but if you need more information about that, you can come back to me and I can advise you on it. But the submission box for Division Research Ethics Committee is actually located as a module hub within your Blackboard sites. Now let's talk a little bit about the introduction of your proposal. What is it about? It's mainly to summarize and critically evaluate previous research that has been done in the area and to also provide a clear justification of why you want to answer the research question that you want. As I mentioned before, there should always be a clear link between the um, writing within this section back to the research question and research aim itself. Now you should place your entire research question into, uh, into context. So if it's a clinical context, you need to, to put that forward so that we, we can see that there is a need for this particular question to be answered. You also need to think about whether uh, previous research has been done on this particular topic. If they have, then what is it that you are trying to answer here that is slightly different or perhaps add on to what previous research has actually done? You need to then justify if that should be done in this particular project of yours. You probably also need, need to uh, ensure that you address some of the major issues within the uh, literature itself. So if there, are, that, if there is a particular major issue that you need to address, will that be addressed by your project? If it's not being addressed by your project, then it may be worth thinking whether you should be including that in your literature um, review because <coughs> you do not want to flag up things that um, is irrelevant that might then, get, um, uh, that might then be questioned um, by the reviewers to th to, uh, during the um, resubmission process where they ask you, why haven't you answered that? Whereas, that's not your intention in the first place to be answering that particular question. So it's just about efficiency in terms of the to and fro's. If you want to learn a little bit more about what to include within this particular section, then I've got a link below at the, uh, for the slide that you can go to, and it's quite a nice little website um, that you can actually look at some of the um, intricacies and details of how to how to write a literature review and background and context for a proposal. <coughs> now, the next section is your research aim and your research question. Now, a lot of people ask me, what is the difference between a research aim and a research question? In fact, they're not too dissimilar. A research question is posed as a question, whereas a research aim is posed as a statement, as a problem statement. Now, research aims and research questions are very different to research hypotheses. Now, research hypotheses is completely, slight, uh, completely different to what a research question is. For a research hypothesis to be constructed, you need to set it up as a null hypothesis. If you've gone through your research methods, you know what a null hypothesis is, and that is the um, that is the negative situation where you're trying to disprove 
a certain situation in order to be able to answer your research question. Now in my experience, it is much better to actually use the research question rather than using research aims. For some research it is much more appropriate, for example, qualitative research is probably easier to use research aims. However, for quantitative research, it is probably much better to um, state a research question. Although they may be similar, as I said before, they are, the way they are constructed are, are actually different. Again, let me reiterate, a research question is posed as a question, and whereas a research aim are posed as problem statements and achievable aims that you're trying to, uh, uh, to sort of um, develop and uh, achieve for this particular project of yours. Now we go on to the methodology section. The methodology, you, you can get into all sorts of details as to what should be included within it. Now, but there are some key points that you need probably to include within the methods section. The first thing is, what is your population that you're trying to study? Who is it that you're trying to study, if, you, if it involves people? <coughs> Next, how are they being recruited? It is good to actually state where you'll be recruiting them and the approach that you'll be recruiting them. How many participants will you require? For quantitative research, it is good to be able to do a sample size calculation and that will justify um, the required number. Now, a lot of times, um, you, within a master's dissertation itself, you're not required to um, conduct a study that requires about 200 participants because of the limited time that you have. But you should give a limited, uh, you should give a reasonable number in order for you to be able to answer your research question. If, however, there are um, resource constraints, then it is perfectly fine to say that, that there are pragmatic considerations in terms of the um, uh, recruitment and therefore um, you'll be recruiting this number of participants because of the pragmatic considerations and that's perfectly acceptable. Now, you also need to state what will be measured. What are some of the outcome measures that you require? Okay, so uh, if you are, let's say, measuring pain, what are some of the outcome measures for pain? For measuring quality of life, what are some of the quality of life measures that you'll be using? It will be worth um, you having a look around to see which types of, um, which types of um, outcome measures are most relevant to your particular project. And as your supervisors review, they may also make suggestions on what type of outcome measures is most relevant and most appropriate for measuring the uh, changes that you'll be observing in your population itself. Now, how will it be measured? You need to ensure that there are some sort of standardization going on so that the um, robustness of how you approach into collecting the data can be addressed. Will there be a um, control group within that? It's not always necessary to include the control group if there are a limited number of uh, if, 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 if it's not appropriate. So do have a good think about whether a control group is relevant to your particular study. How often will they be measured? Will they have follow-up periods? Bear in mind that your entire project have, uh, is a fairly short amount of time. And therefore, if you've got repeated measurements, ensure that uh, this does not go out with the project time. If you feel that there's not enough time to actually do repeated measurements, then perhaps just once will be enough, or twice if you're doing a before treatment and after treatment um, sort of study. It is also worth including what sort of statistical analysis you'll be performing so that the reviewers are assured that you have got the right approach to be dealing and handling your data in order to get the right sorts of results that then can be um, giving you appropriate conclusions. Now for qualitative research, uh, there is a much more emphasis on the approach that you'll be using. So you need probably need to describe the philosophical approach 
that you'll be adopting for this and all the little nuances with regards to the uh, methodological considerations uh, uh, sort of related to that particular philosophical approach. It is worth including a uh, sort of interview guide if you are doing either a focus group, individual interview, or a, any sort of interview mm -hmm. that requires interaction, um, depending on how you approach it. But reviewers would like to at least have a template of what are some of the questions you'll be, you'll be likely to ask. They would take um, your template as the uh, questions that we set in stone, but they will understand that that is the guide that you'll be having and so that they can actually scrutinize and ensure that appropriate questions have been asked to the participants and inappropriate questions have been left out of the um, guide itself. How will you ensure your methodological rigor within your qualitative research? So there are things to think about, for example, the credibility of your approach, what's the transfer transferability of your approach, the dependability and confirmability of your approach. All these needs to be then um, justified within the method section itself if you're conducting a qualitative research. I won't go into the data analysis um, details, but for quantitative and qualitative research, there will be different requirements in terms of what is required for you to ensure that your analysis is rigorous and always ensure that you have got the appropriate method and approach to analyze your data. That is extremely important. It's always that principle of if you put rubbish into, uh, if you put rubbish data into your project and then you use rubbish methods um, to analyze the data, then ultimately you get rubbish results as well. As part of your proposal package, you're required to, uh, if, if you're conducting research where you're recruiting participants, then you most likely need a participant information sheet. The participation information sheet is a sheet containing all the details in a layman's um, format so that the participants can actually understand what they're getting in them, 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 themselves involved before they actually consent to coming in and helping you with your study. There are templates for you to work with and there are general um, sections with um, some guidance as to what should be included in each section. So it's actually worth do downloading the template for the information sheet. There is also um, participation information sheet template uh, located at the website of the Health Research Authority as well for clinical trials. It's actually worth going have a look and see what are some of the different types of templates and then use that to help guide you into writing your own um, uh, sort of customized information sheet. Now, if you're pass uh, recruiting participants and you're asking them, uh, you're giving them a participation information sheet, then most likely you probably be giving them a consent form as well. The consent form is a legal document where you actually state out what are all the requirements and that the participant actually understand all these requirements before they actually agree to help you with your study. So again, there are templates that um, the university can provide you with that you'll be looking at standard clauses and then just simply delete those that do not, ref uh, that, that do not uh, apply to you and modify those that, uh, and modify it slightly so that it, it fits into your project itself. You can also get template consent forms from the website of the Health Research Authority as well. Now for the ethics forms, um, you can get it from the um, dissertation website, but if you go to the Division Research Ethics Committee um, website on the Blackboard site within Queen Margaret University, you will also be able to download some of the latest forms and I would encourage you to go there to download the forms for the latest um, forms that, that's been used. Obviously, um, if you are applying for NHS research ethics, then you need to follow the um, uh, research ethics forms that's been used by Health Research Authority. <coughs> and that would, everything would be online for that. Um, so you need to then log in into the um, NHS Research Ethics Service website in order to be able to gain access 
to the research ethics forms and register yourself and your project on that. Just be aware that if you are doing that, and that um, you do uh, also um, get your supervisors to also read the research ethics that you'll be um, applying to the NHS Research Ethics Service because they need to si sign that off to approve it before you can actually go ahead so that they are aware of what you're trying to do. To help you in terms of getting your documentation right, we have done a checklist. So have a look at this particular checklist. It should be also be on the uh, research ethics forms for the Queen Margaret as well. The NHS research ethics, uh, online research ethics forms will also have a particular checklist that you need to fill in to help you ensure that you've got all the appropriate documentations attached before you do the submission. If you do forget, it will just simply delay your time, which is, uh, which is a bit of a hassle. So try to make sure that you've got all the documentations, appropriate documentations attached so that you don't go to and fro and delay the amount of time that you spend doing these sort of correspondence. Now, as I said before, the supervisor needs to be able to um, read your proposal. So do send um, the draft of your proposal to your supervisor so that they can feedback on you on how to improve it. And once you reach a consensus on a final version, the supervisor will then sign off the uh, proposal itself. If you are get, gaining NHS research ethics approval, the, you'll probably also need to gain the Dean's, uh, the Queen Margaret University School of Health Sciences Dean's approval as a co-sponsor as well and you, you need that to be signed off. So do ask your academic supervisor on how to, to do that or if in doubt come back to me and I can advise you on how to gain the Dean's um, signature as a co-sponsor for your particular research. <coughs> Once you submitted your research ethics approval um, forms, um, usually it takes about between two to four weeks for the reviewers to get back and come to a conclusion. And there are different types of there are different types of decisions that they can come to. They can say that this is all great, you can just simply proceed. Or most likely they'll come back to say that. There are some questions that we need to ask you and there are some minor amendments that we need you to do and can you please do that and then resubmit so that we can have a look before, you, before we give you the final approval. And very unlikely, the most unlikely conclusion or decision will be that they will look at it and go, no, this can't go ahead for some, uh, because there were some serious risks or some major issues that hasn't been actually addressed. So the most likely decision that you get is to make amendments and then resubmit so that the um, research ethics committee can then review it again quickly in order to give you a final approval. You're much less likely to gain approval at the first instance or get rejected at the first instance. And it's not the end of the world if you get rejected in the first instance simply because you'll also get feedback and therefore you can then improve on your project, uh, on, on your, uh, on your ap application and resubmit again and hopefully this time you have addressed all the major issues that the reviewers have pointed out. As I mentioned before, there are some key dates that you need to meet. So uh, I would recommend that the entire approval pr uh, seeking process and writing up the proposal takes between about one to three months, factoring in also the um, uh, feedback gained from your supervisors and give about between three months for the entire approval process in terms of the to and fro between research ethics committee not just with the university but also with the relevant authorities for example like the NHS research ethics committees as well. So that all together will take roughly about six months and then when all the approvals are done email me and your clock for 28 weeks starts and that's when you can start to work on the intermediate products and the different assignments that you need to submit for the dissertation itself. If you'd like to um, read a bit more about how to write proposals, 
and also how to construct projects. Um, I'm I've, 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 I've put up two books that I, I would recommend you, but please do not feel uh, obliged to just read these two. There are a lot of different uh, books out there which are all very helpful. So choose one that is relevant to you and that you will be able to benefit from it most. That's the end of this video. If you've got any questions, what you can do is email me and I'll try my very best to answer your questions as much as I can.